Ah, magic. It's a skill or a power that's been around as long as anybody can trace, and back in the day, it used to be something to be persecuted for. Nowadays, not so much, or I'd be a little more worried about the company I keep. I'm friends with folks who go by, like, Mystery on the Mind Reader. And then there's Papa Jimbo, another famed magician. Look, I also dabble in the art, but I'm not nearly as good at it. I feel like today is as good a time as any to jump into its history, so let me know the names of any magicians you can think of in the comments, and let's see if they make my list. How about we start off with William II de Soules? In 1320, he was involved in a conspiracy against King Robert, along with Sir David, Lord of Brecon. Some say that uh, William wanted the Scottish throne for himself. Others say the goal was to place Edward on the Scottish throne. Nevertheless, he had gathered a couple of followers when he was arrested because you can't overthrow royalty. He was brought before a specially convened session of Parliament on August 4th of 1320, and that's where he confessed his treason. The Parliament found him pretty guilty, he forfeited his title, and was sentenced to life imprisonment. Hey look, dude got off easy. His conspirators fared much worse. They were drawn behind horses, went the way of the rope necklace, and lost their heads. William is said to have died by April of 1321 under some mysterious circumstances. A lot of folklore maintains that he was involved with the black arts after being schooled with Michael Scott, the Wizard of the North. Don't worry, I'll talk about him next. William is also said to have defeated the Northumbrian giant, the Count O'Kilder. I tried, folks! I'm not Scottish! The giant wore an enchanted armor that was impervious to any weapon, but the wizard tricked the giant by knocking him into a river where he, well, met his end. The water is known as the How You Met Your End by the Water pool today. I can't say the D word, okay? Work with me here. Alrighty, as promised, time to discuss Michael Scott. Technically speaking, he was a Scottish mathematician and scholar in the Middle Ages. The legendary man used to feast with his friends with dishes brought by spirits from the royal kitchens of France and Spain and other lands. He is said to have turned to stone a coven of witches, which had become the stone circle of Long Meg and her daughters in Cumbria. Scott's reputation as a magician had already become fixed in the age immediately following his own. He appears in Dante's Divine Comedy, the only Scott to do so, mind you, and the fourth bogia located in the eighth circle of hell, reserved for sorcerers, astrologers, and similar folks. He is described by Dante as being spare in the flank. While some argue that this is the sole extant description of his physical appearance, others think that the description is more poetic. Scott also had a particular reputation for his ability to predict the future. Which is a scary skill to have, dude. Time to move on over to the Count of St. Germain, who was a European adventurer who achieved prominence in European high society of the mid-18th century due to his interest and achievements in science, alchemy, philosophy, and the arts. Nice little mix there. St. Germain used a wide variety of names and titles, including the Marquis de Montserrat, Comte Bellemare, Chevalier Showing, Count Weldon, Comte Soltikoff, Manuel Doria, and others that I cannot pronounce. His real name and specifics about his birth and background are a little murky. He is said to have made claims about being 500 years old, leading Voltaire to dub him the Wonder Man, and that he is a man who does not die and who knows everything. Prince Charles of Hesse Cassel is recorded as having called him one of the greatest philosophers who ever lived. Many groups on honor St. Germain as a supernatural being called a master of the ancient wisdom or an ascended master. In the ascended master teachings, he's referred to simply as St. Germain or as the ascended master St. Germain, which is a mouthful. As an ascended master, Germain is believed to have many magical powers, such as the ability to teleport, levitate, walk through walls, and to inspire people by telepathy, among others. The Theosophical Society, which I'm going to mention a lot today, considered him to be a Mahatma, master of ancient wisdom, or adept. Helena Blavatsky said that he was one of her masters of wisdom, and hinted that he had given her some secret documents. Some esoteric groups credit him with inspiring the Founding Fathers to draft the United States Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, as well as providing the design of the Great Seal of the United States. Apparently he's also been reincarnated a couple of times over the years to boot, so quite the legacy. Edward Kelly, also known as Edward Talbot, was an English Renaissance occultist and scryer, who is best known for working with John Dee in his magical investigations. Besides the professed ability to see spirits or angels in a shoe, stone, or mirror, which was very valued, Kelly also said that he possessed the secret of transmuting base metals into gold, the goal of alchemy, as well as the philosopher's stone itself. Kelly's angels communicated to him in a special language termed Angelical, subsequently called Enochian, which he then relayed to others. Kelly said that Angelical was dictated by angels, who he saw, and her by means of scrying in a crystal ball or mirror. He also described the angels as communicating by means of tapping out letters displayed in a rectangular tablet. The first third were tapped out with each Angelical word backwards the following two-thirds with each word forwards. There are no significant errors or discrepancies in word usage between
between the first and following parts. The English translations were not tapped out, but according to Kelly, appeared on little strips of paper coming out of the angels' mouths. Experts considered the dictation of the angelical material highly important for three reasons. Firstly, it was believed that angelical represented a documentable case of true glossolalia, thereby proving Kelly was actually speaking with the angels and not from his imagination. Secondly, the angels communicated that their language was actually the original prototype of Hebrew, the language with which God spoke to Adam, and thus the first human word. Third, the angelical material takes the form of a set of conjurations, which would summon an extremely powerful set of angels who would reveal many secrets to those who sought them, especially the key to the Philosopher's Stone, to godlike wisdom and eternal life. Speaking of the Philosopher's Stone, you can't talk about that without bringing up Nicholas Flamel. No, I'm not about to talk about the fictional stuff, folks. I'm personally anti anything to do with the work of J.K. Rowling because of the harm she has caused a lot of people. The real Flamel was a French scribe and manuscript seller. After his death, he developed a reputation as an alchemist, believed to have created and discovered the Philosopher's Stone and to have thereby achieved immortality. These legendary accounts first appeared in the 17th century, and according to texts ascribed to Flamel almost 200 years after his death, he had learned alchemical secrets from a Jewish converso on the road to Santiago de Compostela. Flamel had made it his life's work to understand the text of a mysterious 21 page book he had purchased in 1357 at the cost of just two florins. Apparently, around 1378, he traveled to Spain for assistance with translation. On the way back, he reported that he met a sage who identified Flamel's book as being a copy of the original book of Abelin the Mage. With this knowledge, over the next couple of years, Flamel and his wife allegedly decoded enough of the book to successfully replicate the recipe for the Philosopher's Stone, producing first silver in 1382 and then gold. I know a lot of miners who would love that right now. Okay, how about a chat about a gal next? Dion Fortune was a British occultist, ceremonial magician, novelist, and author. She was a co founder of the Fraternity of the Inner Light, an occult organization that promoted philosophies, which she claimed had been taught to her by spiritual entities known as the Ascended Masters. As a prolific writer, she produced a large number of articles and books on her occult ideas and also authored seven novels, several of which expound occult themes. She became interested in esotericism through the teachings of the Theosophical Society before joining an occult lodge led by Theodore Moriarty and then the Alpha A Omega occult organization. She came to learn that she was being contacted by two ascended masters and underwent transmediumship to channel the masters' messages. In 1922, Fortune and Charles Loveday claimed that during one of these ceremonies, they were contacted by the masters who provided them with a text, the Cosmic Doctrine. Although Fortune became the president of the Christian Mystic Lodge of the Theosophical Society, she believed the society to be uninterested in Christianity and split from it to form the Community of the Inner Light, a group that was later renamed the Fraternity of the Inner Light. With Loveday, she established bases in both Glastonbury and Bayswater in London and began issuing a magazine. She gave public lectures and promoted the growth of the society. During the big global event of the 30s and 40s, you will know which one. She organized a project of meditations and visualizations designed to protect Britain. She began planning for what she believed was a coming post event age of Aquarius, although she passed of leukemia shortly after the big events end. Her novels proved an influence on later occult and modern pagan groups such as Wicca. All right, time to chat about the famous history folks now, and I might as well start with Rasputin. He was a Russian mystic and a holy man, and is best known for having befriended the imperial family of Nicholas II, the last emperor of Russia, through whom he gained considerable influence in the final years of the Russian Empire. I know, it's putting it mildly, but I only have so much time, folks. He was a figure of much debate amongst the royal court, with some describing him as a visionary and a prophet, others a charlatan, others a phony, a fake, a scam artist. Having taken many pilgrimages to holy monasteries, he developed a reputation as a revered holy man, gaining quite the circle of followers who believed in his miracles, and began leading a lot of private prayer meetings, much to the scorn and suspicion of a lot of villagers and priests. It was rumored that specifically female followers were ceremonially watched him before each meeting, that the group sang strange songs, and even that they joined a religious sect whose rituals were rumored to include self-flagellation and group pleasure events. Oh, another classic name, Merlin. Technically, depending on who you ask, he's a mythical figure who is best known as a magician, but he's a key enough part of history. The familiar depiction, based on an amalgamation of historic and legendary figures, was introduced by the 12th century British pseudo-history author Geoffrey of Monmouth, and then was built on by the French poet Robert de Boron and their pro successors in the 13th century. This brings me to another famous fictitious name, Morgan Le Fay. She was a powerful and ambiguous enchantress from the legend of King Arthur, and most often 
a sibling. Early appearances of Morgan in Arthurian literature do not elaborate her character beyond her role as a goddess, a fae, a witch, or a sorceress, generally benevolent and connected to Arthur as his magical savior and protector. Her prominence increased as did the legend of Arthur over time, and her moral ambivalence kind of came to be. In a lot of texts there is an evolutionary transformation of her to an antagonist, which that's a little more popular. Okay, I suppose I could end today with a more modern real magician, and that's Harry Houdini. He was a Hungarian American escape artist, illusionist, and stunt performer, mostly recognized for his escape acts. His pseudonym is a reference to his mentor in magic, the French magician Robert Houdin. While many suspected that his escapes were faked, Houdini presented himself as the scourge of fake spiritualists, pursuing a personal crusade to expose any kind of fraudulent methods. As president of the Society of American Magicians, he was keen to uphold professional standards and expose any frauds. He was also quick to sue anybody who imitated his escape stunts. And that's it for me once again, folks. I've been Alexa, your resident emo girly. Make sure to give this video some love, and I'll see y'all next time. I buzz in over here at Bumblebee.